The Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Blockchain Super Conference is coming to Dallas, Texas, February 16, 17, and 18 in 2018. If you know of a better way to get the latest insider knowledge about crypto, to hear directly from the top minds in this field, to interact personally with 800 fellow crypto lovers, hodlers, investors, miners, traders, developers, and founders, then I'd like to hear about it. If you don't, then you don't want to miss out. Register today for the Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Blockchain Super Conference. Go to BitcoinSuperConference.com and register today as a super early bird to get the lowest rates on tickets and hotel rooms. That's BitcoinSuperConference.com. Welcome to Almost Here, Round the Corner of Future Technology podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies poised to transform our lives for better or worse are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used or just around the corner from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. Hey, this is Richard Jacobs with Future Tech Podcast. My guest today is Jameson Lopp. Uh, head of the infrastructure team at BitGo, B-I-T-G-O. Jameson, how you doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, when I hear your name, I picture a bottle of, uh, I believe, whiskey. So it's a, a good association. Yes, you. <laughs> I, I do have a uh, fair amount of uh, Irish in my blood. Excellent, excellent. All right, well, tell me about uh, a little bit about your background, and then let's talk about BitGo, what you guys do there. Sure. Uh, so I'm a computer science uh, major, been uh, Working for about 10 years now, and for the first part of my career was mainly working in uh, big data, like cloud analytics type stuff for uh, online marketing, and uh, ended up getting interested in Bitcoin and crypto assets. And uh, after I had been just sort of piddling around as an enthusiast and doing some open source projects, just trying to better understand the space, Eventually, uh, it grew large enough that I realized that I could just go ahead and do it full time since I was already spending so much of my time uh, trying to understand it better and working on it. So I've been at BitGo for about two and a half years now, and you know we started out mainly servicing uh, Bitcoin wallets uh, at the enterprise level, you know, exchanges and remittance providers, and really anyone who is processing large amounts of Bitcoin. And after doing that for a few years, started diversifying out. And these days we support all kinds of things from Litecoin to Ethereum, uh, Ripple. And then even most recently, we have our own permissioned blockchain that uh, we developed with the uh, British Royal Mint and Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which is going to be used as a gold trading platform. Huh. Yeah, tell me about that. So it's a, it's a private permission blockchain and it's going to be used to... Um, I guess, digitized, tokenized uh, trading of gold, where? All over Basically. the U.S. or all over the world? Uh, yeah, uh, it should be you know, all over the world. Um, you know, there's a number of different institutions that are playing parts in this, but the idea being that you know, people have been trading gold in various ways uh, for really all of human history. And then in, in you know, recent 20th century, I guess, the... Uh, uh, paper gold trading products came online, uh, and a lot of them have been digitized. But while some people are trading the like the real quote unquote paper assets like the gold ETFs, there are other people who want to trade the actual physical gold and you know um, be able to call in their ownership of that gold to get physical delivery of it. They want to be sure that whatever they're trading is actually backed by real gold somewhere. And there have been products where people can do that, but there's uh, there's still you know some some trust issues going on where uh, you have to be you know trusting the auditability of uh, the physical gold wherever it's being vaulted. So the main idea here is that we're just using a blockchain to replace the very low level layer of of the auditability, so that uh, the gold will be in the vault at the British Royal Mint. So there is, you know, some trust there, but the British Royal Mint is a thousand year old institution. So it's really hard to get much more trustworthy than that. And once the, uh, the British Royal Mint has their own audits conducted and published, they then, you know, allocate, uh, 
a certain amount of, of gold onto this blockchain. And at that point, the, the auditability really becomes automated. And you can then use the various features of a blockchain, such as running your own node, to verify the entire history of all of the transactions that occur on it. Um, the, one of the additional value adds that you get now is that trying to trade these gold-based products currently is, is kind of tricky because you have to be at a, a centralized exchange with, with other people that are trading that same product. But now when you're on a, a blockchain that is you know, more of this uh, global decentralized ledger, you have a new sort of peer-to-peer -peer trading aspect. So you're, you're getting a number of, of different features really added at the low-level layer. Though, of course, fundamentally, you still are going to have uh, a fair amount of trust with the, the actual vaulting institution. Well, in addition to trusting the vaulting institution, you know, are they going to do things like, uh, I don't know, stamp a serial number on each piece of gold, and then you can hash that and you can record the uh, the existence of a given piece of gold on the blockchain? Or is it just going to be, depending on their audit, and, uh, you know, the, the blockchain will be used to just make sure that the audit is public, or at least semi-public? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really for the latter, because, you know, once you get it onto the blockchain, you can then subdivide these actual, uh, you know, digitized gold into, you know, uh, like 10 to the negative eight or whatever pieces. So it would be very hard to then, you know, just keep track of it with, with physical serial numbers because the uh, subdivision and recombination can happen on the blockchain very easily. Though there will be, you know, uh, minimum size amounts if you actually want to call in for a physical delivery of the asset. Are you going to try to pull in other players in the gold industry? Like I talked to Vault Oro, for instance. You know, they they have a vault of gold and they want to digitize it. I mean, I, I'm sure besides the British World Mint, there's a lot of other players that may want to come on board. Or is this going to be just a, a project with them to start? Yeah, you know, I'm not entirely sure how it would end up working. Like if, if other institutions wanted to get on the same blockchain, uh, then we'd have to figure out how we would uh, share the sort of administrative level permissions. I mean, I'm sure it's possible. Uh, you know, we're basically building the open source software to enable anyone to do this. Um, so actually, you can go to provachain.com, uh, P-R-O-V-A chain.com, to, to see more about the actual software that we built. And it's basically a fork of Bitcoin, and then we added in uh, various administrator uh, permissioning systems to allow the uh, administrator of the system to do things like uh, allocate and deallocate assets or uh, provision and deprovision validators on the network or provision and deprovision wallets on the network, stuff like that. Gotcha. All right, well, tell me about the other projects that BitGo has going. You just touched on them very briefly, but let's return to them. Uh, yeah, I mean, our, our primary stuff is all in the you know public permissionless crypto asset space, uh, really just trying to service the the most valuable, most heavily traded crypto assets out there. Since really most of our really large customers end up being exchanges, uh, we have you know big incentive to then support whatever assets are being traded the most. And so, Bitgo's uh, sort of bread and butter, if you will is a uh, hot wallet security. And so like we all know crypto asset security can be a nightmare because if you get hacked, you lose everything and there's no recourse. Like there's no, you know, uh, central administrator to revert the transaction and give you your money back. So you have to be very, very uh, careful and paranoid really with your security. So if you want the ultimate security, okay. it's very simple. All you do is uh, take your private keys and take them off of the internet. You know, this cold storage solution, uh, which you probably hear about fairly often. And that's great. I mean, you're taking cybersecurity and pulling it into the physical realm makes it a very solvable problem because physical security is well known, like humans have been dealing with this forever. But the problem becomes then when that's not a solution because you need to be able to create transactions and you need to be able to uh, you know, send these assets back and forth in an automated fashion in order to make it right. efficient and, and make people happy. So uh, then you, you need to have a hot wallet where these 
private keys are exposed to the internet. And that's where, you know, a lot of the disasters throughout the history of Bitcoin and, and crypto assets uh, have happened where these exchanges have, you know, millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars just sitting on servers that are open to the internet. So really what we do is we, we provide a multi-signature uh, software product where we're splitting up the keys. We use a two out of three key solution. And so we, we split these keys up in, amongst multiple different computers so that BitGo has one piece uh, of the key, the user has one key, and then they, they keep another uh, recovery key offline as a sort of disaster recovery uh, insurance. So this gives us some very in interesting properties. It's, it's still two out of three you yeah. get into so, an account, right? Uh, yeah, in order to actually create a valid transaction in any of these wallets from, from valid from a network perspective, you have to have two different signatures from two of the three keys, which gives you a very interesting uh, set of properties, uh, one of which is BitGo is not custodial. We only ever have one key, so we cannot unilaterally freeze anyone's money, nor can we unilaterally spend anyone's money. And then... If you think about like the different situations of you know what hackers could do, if the hacker uh, hacks our user, they only get one key, so they can't steal the money. If they hack BitGo, they don't have enough uh, data to be able to steal the money. Um, but even better, if BitGo ceases to exist for any reason, the user can still go get their recovery key. You have two out of three keys, and then completely route around us. Just use software to. to create a transaction to move to a new wallet without ever having to uh, talk to our servers. Well, that's pretty smart. Where, do the, uh, where does the third key, the insurance key, tend to be stored? Well, uh, historically, the user would always create that themselves. But um, we have a number of different options. We have an offline generation tool, or there, you can actually use any number of, of options to, to create your own backup key offline. Uh, you can create it in the browser, which is one of the, the less secure methods, but it's easier for a lot of people. Um, and then, of course, hold it yourself. And then we have uh, a new option that we brought online about a year ago because we found that you know a lot of users are not technically sophisticated and do not follow very good IT practices with regards to backing up their data. So one of our, our default options these days for your standard user is that the key actually gets created by and stored by a third party key recovery service that BitGo has no control over. So in, in that case, like if BitGo ceased to exist or if we got compromised, those recovery keys are inaccessible to us. Okay, well, very good. And is this, this three key setup, is this for any user? You know, what do enterprise companies tend to do and how do they do it differently with their key management? Yeah, so we, we require two out of three key uh, setup for absolutely everyone, whether it's an individual wallet or an enterprise wallet. And then, you know, one of the first questions that usually comes up is, well, what if I want to have, you know, multiple signatories, you know, within my own institution? And we actually believe that the two out of three key solution is best from a cryptographic standpoint because it, it essentially allows us to create this model where BitGo is like a, a co-signer or like an oracle. And so we are in a position where we can then apply any number of arbitrary security rules or checks on our end. So we actually have the ability to then much more flexibly uh, be able to say, you know, add a rule that says, well, you actually need to have like three different administrators at your institution sign off before BitGo will then sign off. So we are able to add like more arbitrary uh, levels of security for enterprises if they need to do that. It's just not done at the protocol level. It's done at the like the BitGo level. I gotcha. And what, um, so what kind of wallets do have you, you guys have created your own wallets? Or, I mean, I guess you wouldn't be using third party ones, so you've created your own. What, what yep. tokens do you support? So right now it is uh, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ripple, Ethereum, uh, the Royal Mint Gold, and then we are currently adding support for ERC20 tokens, like generally. 
And uh, I'm not entirely sure, you know, which tokens we'll end up adding. That's, you know, more of a business decision. But once we have like general uh, token support, it'll, you know, only be a few lines of code to add each new token after that. Right, especially in the ERC20 line, it should be pretty easy. Yep. Sorry. So what's going to be happening? What projects are going on to you guys in the next six months or a year? What's on the roadmap? Well, uh, there's the, the interesting thing about roadmaps in this space is that they, they tend to get disrupted a lot. So uh, for the past year, we were rewriting a lot of our infrastructure to make it easier for us to be able to add support for new blockchains. And, you know, all of those other non-Bitcoin blockchains that I talked about, we just have added on uh, over this uh, current year. And, uh, you know, the token thing, I have no idea where that might lead. Um, But also just we've had to to deal with all of these forking situations. So, you know, Bitcoin Cash, uh, which actually really coincided with like the segregated witness support and now the whole SegWit2x uh, fork. And these are constantly providing innovative new challenges uh, for us to overcome, for us basically to be able to service the demand of our customers who want to be able to access these new uh, assets that have basically been airdropped onto them. But, you know, the the onus is on us to be able to provide software to allow them to do that in a safe manner. So we've, we've had to actually expend a fair amount of time dealing with these completely unanticipated forks. Yeah, definitely. Do you think uh, atomic swaps are going to play a role in helping you uh, so you don't have to try to accommodate every coin under the sun in terms of a wallet? Yeah, someday. Uh, so, like, we we just started internally working on, uh, you know, payment channel support at, at a very basic level. And then that will also be a multi-stage process that I expect will take, you know, a year, if not longer. But the the final goal will be that BitGo wallets that are using protocols that can support it will be able to uh, you know, get onto Lightning Networks and hopefully eventually also be able to then be able to very easily perform atomic swaps. So I know that we get a lot of customer support requests uh, from people who assume that we're some type of exchange or offer exchange services, and we always have to tell them, you know, well, we re- recommend going here or there. But it would be great if in the future, if we can just have, you know, a button in the wallet that says, hey, do you want to exchange this crypto asset for that crypto asset? And then all they have to do is click a button and uh, put in their password and their two-factor authentication. And the exchange can happen basically instantly uh, without ever having to you know, trust a third party to broker it. Yeah, that's why I ask. I'm sure a lot of people are getting more and more interested in that. So it would be nice to have a wallet of the future where you just, you know, Whatever is in there, you can pick whatever uh, final token you want it to be used as a payment method, and it just goes root, swaps it internally. You know. Yeah, I mean, I think that these these payment channel solutions have a ton of of promise of what they will be able to do, though they've probably be, been over promised a bit by by some people. You know, there's going to be a lot of work uh, at the very low levels uh, that engineers are going to have to do. To, to make sure that these networks are robust. And then, you know, the sort of user interface designer folks are going to have to come in and figure out how to then make it a user-friendly experience once the stuff, on all the technology under the hood is robust enough that we can say that, you know, we're willing to put this into a production environment and put real money on it. All right, so what other project are you guys working on we haven't talked about either now or upcoming? Um, let's see. Well... I, I'm not on the forefront of all of the the business deals and and stuff that are going on, but you know, like I said, we are diversifying. We diversified amongst the various blockchains that are out there, but uh, one of the major things that we did was diversify into uh, starting to provide services to build you know custom blockchains for other people. So. Uh, I think that you know getting the Royal Mint Gold product out there and getting the the Prova uh, open source software out is kind of another first step where we will continue to be pitching you know various custom built blockchain solutions generally like for institutions that want uh, some sort of permissioned based chain. So I, I doubt that Royal Mint Gold will be the last. Is certainly 
not the intention for it to be a one-off thing, just really anticipating it becoming another uh, service offering that we add. Is there, are you guys going to take the Royal Mint's blockchain, make a template out of it, and can it be used for any ancillary industries that are similar or, or even different, but just use the same kind of implementation so you can move yeah, on basically, to other... Yeah, uh, basically, and, and I would then anticipate that, you know, as other institutions come to us and say, well, we like this, but we also want features X, Y, and Z, that we would then build those features into the open source Prova software and continue to improve that, make it better over the years, make it uh, you know even more feature rich. Right on. All right, well, Jameson, tell us, uh, tell listeners how they can get in touch with BitGo if they have a, you know want you guys to work on a, their own blockchain, you know their own private permission blockchain, or if they want to experience your wallets. What's the best way to get in touch? Yeah, if if you generally have a need for securing and uh, transacting in large amounts of crypto asset value and need to protect it from getting hacked, uh, definitely check out our website at bitgo.com. And we we do offer individual wallets, but we are primarily an enterprise-focused business. And so we offer some robust, easy-to-use APIs and SDKs such that once you integrate with us to support one crypto asset, it then becomes very, very easy for you to support many different crypto assets, usually just changing a few lines of code in your API calls. Okay, very good. Well, James, and thanks for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. My pleasure. The Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Blockchain Super Conference is coming to Dallas, Texas, February 16, 17, and 18 in 2018. If you know of a better way to get the latest insider knowledge about crypto, to hear directly from the top minds in this field, to interact personally with 800 fellow crypto lovers, hodlers, investors, miners, traders, developers, and founders, then I'd like to hear about it. If you don't, then you don't want to miss out. Register today for the Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Blockchain Super Conference. Go to BitcoinSuperConference.com and register today as a super early bird to get the lowest rates on tickets and hotel rooms. That's BitcoinSuperConference.com. You have been listening to Almost Here, Around the Corner Future Technology Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Subscribe to this podcast, post to review, to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse, such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more.